Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to The Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm gonna be sweating $10,000 across 10 lucky subscribers this month. And let's just jump into it. You know, the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is this dumb motherfucker out of Springville, Utah. So there was this absolutely massive wildfire that ignited somehow out of nowhere yesterday. With those flames ultimately consuming around 60 acres before luckily being doused by a rainstorm. And as far as what actually caused the fire, it turns out it was spiders. <gasps> Kind of. Like it was spiders in the same way that if I was in a car and I saw a snake and I wanted to run over the snake and instead I like slammed into a pole, it was the snake that crashed the car. Because late in the afternoon when firefighters arrived on the scene, they encountered a man with his dog who immediately confessed to accidentally starting the fire. Because apparently this all happened because he tried to kill a spider with a lighter. But instead he caught a bush on fire which led to all of this. So now he's been arrested on fire related charges. Though uh, it doesn't appear like that was the only thing he was blazing. With police also reportedly finding marijuana and drug paraphernalia in his backpack which they're charging him for as well. And as far as what the authorities have to say, uh, regarding trying to set a spider on fire, they said, quote, please don't do that. And it hurts my brain that the police even need to say that, but it turns out like this isn't like the only time this has ever happened. And arguably the other time the guy was unequivocally dumber because that guy tried to use a lighter to burn a spider while the spider was sitting on his gas tank at the gas station. Although at least that moment gave us the clip of employees mocking the guy. I don't like spiders, huh? You know what they say about spiders. Let me get my lighter here and burn that spider off. Okay. Oh, 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 geez, that's hot. Oh boy. But ultimately with this story, I guess two things. One, please don't do this. And two, isn't it just such a fun thing to know that these people's votes equal your vote? Like both of you have the equal ability to mold our country. Isn't that fun? Fuck. Then in entertainment news, we had actually gaming slash entertainment news that was blowing up past the normal audiences that would consume it. With the first story being about Nadia Amin, who's one of the fastest growing female streamers in COD and Warzone. With all this starting because Nadia actually hit this insane clip, which if you've ever played Warzone, you, you just can't deny how impressive this is. <laughs> this clip right here proves why I am the best female Warzone player. Well, you'd expect that clip to go viral. Instead, what went viral was an edit of that, with someone superimposing her face cam over a game where you're washing dishes. With that, then leading to the likes of Jake Lucky posting the edit on Twitter and saying, what it's like to be a woman in gaming. This is Nadia, one of the fastest growing female streamers in Cotton Warzone. Hits a nasty clip and first thing to happen is a TikTok making fun of her that now has 450,000 likes and nearly 3 million views. And in response to that, we saw two very different reactions. Some saying things like, I'm so fucking tired of women being treated like subhumans by boys in gaming. If your ego is that fragile, go do something else. Female gamers are not a threat to you simply because of their gender. Grow the fuck up. Major creators like Hassan Pike are also chiming in saying this shit is so corny, especially because these girls would shred most of the insecure weirdos trying to cope. But also we saw pushback. People saying things like snowflakes everywhere for fuck's sake. Modern Warfare 2 lobbies were a hundred times worse. As well as she's an insane gamer, but fuck this world is becoming way too sensitive. Can't say half the shit slash do the shit you could 10 years ago. The world's gone soft. She needs to look at the fact that it got views. Plenty of people will see that clip and watch her. That's a positive. Get over it. But with all that said, as far as what Nadia herself thought, she responded by thanking people for supporting her and saying, we cannot let this type of misogynistic hatred take us women down. I will never ever give up on what I love doing and neither should anyone, we keep going. And as far as my opinion on this, is this edit tame? Yeah, but is it also annoying, dismissive, and disrespectful to someone that's just enjoying a fucking thing purely based off of their gender? Yeah. Also, as someone that was in those Modern Warfare 2 lobbies, shut the fuck up. Someone yelled a bunch of expletives about fucking your mom and, and said a bunch of slurs while eating their microphone and all of a sudden, like, you have valor? Stop talking about it like you went through war, you little bitch boy. Like, I don't think you know what a sad little sack of shit it makes you look like. And with Historia around Nadia, yes, you could say it's tame, it's just one situation, but it does have highlight a very real issue. There have been reports where nearly 80% of women in gaming said that they experienced gender-based discrimination while gaming. Literally to the point that nearly 60% of them say they mask their identity to avoid harassment. But yeah, that's the situation and my current thoughts as a former edge lord that used to think 15 years ago that like, haha, women make sandwich in the kitchen was the funniest shit ever. It's not, it's cringe, it's stupid, grow the fuck up. And then in the other bit of gaming entertainment news, we had Tyler Ninja Blevins. And for a while, he was one of the biggest names in gaming. And even though he doesn't still pull the same numbers, he still matters in that space and beyond. Being one of a select group to break out into the mainstream deals with Adidas. Also, as the reason we're talking about him today, he actually has a masterclass, which if you're unfamiliar, is this online subscription service where experts in various fields and industries guide you through tutorials and pre-recorded lectures. 
And the range on these classes, it's massive. Where you can learn how to talk to slash interrogate people all the way to developing an original TV series with the Duffer Brothers. You know, for Ninja, this has to be a pretty big achievement, though not his biggest achievement ever, because remember, the guy we're talking about, in his own words, was once in the middle of carrying a League of Legends game, about to close it out, and his brawless wife brought him a sandwich, not asked for, with chips, as he got a double kill bot lane. I'm about to bust. But still, Masterclass gotta be up there in the top 20. Though possibly bringing Blevins down are people dunking on him over his Masterclass. To the point where you had people asking him, is this just a cash grab or is this just a scam? Which uh, I will say, I, I think is a word that people throw around far too often these days. But as far as the notable specifics, you have Ninja teaching people how to quote, become a streamer. With that course's description reading, build your streaming presence in 30 days. It appears that much of the criticism seems to be stemming from a video posted by YouTuber Drew Goodman. A video that notably quickly shot to the top of YouTube's trending videos. And in the video, Drew included some examples from the course itself. It's plug and play for a reason. It may seem a little scary, but it, it's not. There's tutorials everywhere on the internet. Uh, Ninja, I don't know if you, I don't know if you know this. You're filming a tutorial. Don't outsource the work to someone else. Just tell me how to do these things while I'm here. It's so funny to hear him describe the things that he does well in like an analytical way. See, I'm wearing my hat. I'm clearly doing a funny voice. Headphones were upgraded. The, uh, my, my hair was blue. Now we're getting somewhere. These are actionable steps. Wear a funny hat and dye your hair. Actually, how many times he mentions his blue hair in this class. Okay, so we have Ninja blue hair, right? I dyed my hair blue and everyone thought, okay, now blue haired person, me dyeing my hair blue and the hair, the hair, my hair was blue. It's almost like he's convinced himself that one of the secrets to his success is that he dyed his hair a funny color. And then, of course, it's just the naturally unobtainable aspects of the course, like how to become big online or branding and marketing. With Drew saying, yes, those are important topics, but Ninja doesn't really do anything tangible in that he just sort of lists his own accomplishments. And like I said, there are tons of examples. I'll link to Drew's video down below. But essentially, he describes the course as being very front-loaded with some useful content and then just dropping off, having these shorter videos that just kind of ramble on. With Drew also saving up some of that criticism for Masterclass itself, saying that during lessons where Ninja was detailing step-by-step -step tutorials on his computer, you couldn't even see the screen. This happens multiple times. It kind of makes me think that they just forgot to record his screen while he was doing this section. And instead of attempting to recreate that B-roll, they just gave up and put nothing there. It's so bad. That's not even Tyler's fault, you know, but it does show a general lack of caring from everyone involved. So in response to all this, we started seeing comments pop up like Masterclass always seemed like a scam to me. With others saying that he's just exploiting his audience by putting out some half-assed Masterclass. We've also seen big streamers reacting and saying that they do the exact opposite of Ninja's advice. The others have also offered up some defense saying, I think most people take online classes for entertainment, not knowledge. Which, I mean, may be the case for other people. I don't, <laughs> but you know, people People consume content for different reasons, so I guess I won't uh, completely throw that away. But ultimately, with all this, as far as my opinion, just a few things to say. One, will I consume this masterclass? Not a fucking chance. But two, do I think that this is a scam? No, we gotta step, like, if you think that it is subpar, overvalued, a cash grab that doesn't provide value, Call it that, that's not a scam. That is just a shitty product. And if you're gonna make this argument of him exploiting his audience, that's pretty much any creator that makes money in some way. Like just by definition, they are deriving value from a resource. You, paid subscription, sponsors, getting awesome clothing like that, link down below to beautifulbest.com. And if it's shitty, that just reflects poorly on the person that made it and is putting it out. And then the market will react how the market reacts. Also, I will say, Almost everything you want to learn is out there for free. And I don't mean like Pirate Bay free, I mean like YouTube free. There are genuinely very few creators that I would pay for any sort of tutorial or class. The only two that immediately come to mind, uh, Mark Rober and Casey Neistat. And I'm sure there are plenty of others, but those two stand out in my mind specifically because they like guide you through specific projects. And if you can end some class or tutorial series actually having done something, created something, used what you learned, I mean, that that seems like a huge value. Also, Casey, if more people buy your class, like if you see a bump. I expect a fucking check in the mail, Casey. And that is where I'm going to end this story. But the question I have here, has there been a class that you paid for or just a, a, a free tutorial online that's been the most beneficial to you that you would recommend? Let us know in those comments down below. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. You know, I've been partnering with Squarespace for years now. And I have to say, if you're getting your business off the ground or creating a place to share your homemade goods, new favorite hobby, current obsession, or even a personal blog to get all those thoughts out of your head, no matter what you're doing, Squarespace is there to help. It's so easy. 
easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. And with their mobile-optimized websites, your website automatically adjusts. Your content looks great on any device. Plus, with Squarespace, you get access to all their marketing tools, their analytics, and their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat 24-7. So if you want to check it out, see why so many others love it, see if it's right for you, go start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash phil. And when you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code phil to get 10% off your first purchase. And then let's talk about some interesting but quickie news, starting with hobby games. Do you play them? And I ask because thanks to the pandemic, that industry is booming right now. Right back in 2019, $1.68 billion worth of hobby games were sold in the US and Canada, then jumping to over $2 billion in 2020, and then hitting $2.69 billion in 2021. And I mentioned this for two reasons. One, I highly recommend it. When I say hobby games, I'm talking about things like role-playing, tabletop games, board games, card games, miniatures, stuff like that. My wife and I have recently picked stuff up over the last year. Uh, one of my favorites is definitely Sherlock, which, which is just like a mystery investigation game. You can actually play that one by yourself or with a group and oh my God, so fun. But also two, I mentioned this because if you like hobby games, I would love your recommendations. What are you playing and why would you recommend it? I know I'm only speaking to 1% of the audience here, but I'm intrigued. Then please use your dishwasher. Your country is begging you. According to reports in US households that have dishwashers, one in five just aren't used. That's 17 million households that just go, Nah. And reportedly it's because people have this perception that dishwashers are inefficient and ineffective. But as it turns out, those people, as well as all our parents who said, hey, wash those dishes by hand, they were wrong. One, if you want your dishes to be clean, load the dishwasher properly. And two, uh, according to the EPA, new dishwashers, in fact, only use 10% of the water that's used during hand washing. So the next time your parents or your significant others like wash those dishes by hand, ask them why they hate the planet. And then let's talk about news that uh, depending on your worldview is the continuation of the nightmare horror show that we're having in America right now, or just a fun little perk, uh, we go to Georgia. And that's because the Georgia Department of Revenue has just confirmed that residents can literally claim embryos as dependents on their taxes. And according to the department, the new guidance reflects the reversal of Roe v. Wade and the decision by appeals court to uphold Georgia's six-week abortion ban, which notably has a so-called personhood provision that gives full constitutional rights to any embryo or fetus that has a detectable heartbeat. And so now, any Georgia taxpayer that has what they refer to as an unborn child with a detectable heartbeat from July 20th to December 31st of this year can claim a dependent and personal exemption in the amount of $3,000 for each embryo for returns filed in the 2022 tax year. And according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the law also allows expectant mothers to file for child support to cover the cost of pregnancy and delivery and requires the fetuses to be included in Georgia's census count. So now the fetuses will get congressional representation. Now, with all that said, while that coverage probably would be nice for people who want a baby, it's not much solace for people who are being forced to carry out a pregnancy in a state that bans abortions before many even know they're pregnant. It's also unclear how much this will actually cover the ridiculous cost of pregnancy care and delivery in this amazing and country we live in, especially for those who are uninsured or don't have good insurance. But also beyond that, notably you have critics of the personhood provision saying that this creates some very alarming legal gray areas. With the likes of Vanity Fair noting, what happens if a person claims an unborn child on their taxes and then has a miscarriage? What happens if they claim the unborn child and then travel out of state for an abortion? These are obviously just two of about a million questions the new law raises. Right? We've seen similar personhood provisions and abortion laws facing legal challenges in other states, this including in Arizona, where a judge literally stopped the implementation of the measure because it was, quote, unconstitutional vague. And so as far as additional clarification on the Georgia law or just seeing what the hell happens here, we're gonna have to wait to see. And then finally today, let's talk about the specifics of how that motherfucker Joe Biden just took $25 million out of my pocket. On Saturday, at my direction, the United States successfully concluded an airstrike in Kabul, Afghanistan that killed the Emir of Al-Qaeda, Iman al-Zawiri. Now, justice has been delivered. And this terrorist leader is no more. No matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. Joe, I was this close. Right, and so if you look at that picture and you're like, who the fuck is that guy? Zawiri, who I'll now refer to just as a bag of garbage, had been the second in command of Al-Qaeda for decades until taking over after bin Laden's death and is believed to have been intimately involved in planning the 9-11 attacks alongside others. We also know that this bag of garbage's exact whereabouts were known for at least a week before the airstrike and at that time, he was visiting the home of immediate family members. Now currently we don't know the full extent of the damage as the Taliban has been relatively quiet about this, but US officials claim that no civilians were killed. But what we do know 
is that the Taliban is furious about the attack, claiming it was a violation of the Doha Agreement, which was the agreement that ended the US's involvement in Afghanistan. And as a part of that agreement, there was supposed to be a complete ceasefire. But on the flip side, you had Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying Afghanistan actually violated the agreement first because they were knowingly harboring this bag of garbage. And to use the technical term, that is a massive no-no in the agreement, with Al-Qaeda being one of the few specifically named banned groups. And it appears that the Taliban knew that they were found out because shortly after the attack, they made efforts to block off the scene and cover up the fact that this bag of garbage was in there. And for me personally, I just want to know if this fuck face, like if he felt safe. It's been 20 years, the Taliban has taken back control of Afghanistan. The Americans probably forgot about me. But to that, I would say, motherfucker, we've been saying it for 20 years. The only thing our government loves more than oil is killing motherfuckers that did us wrong. But that said, in general, the assassination has been widely praised by many Americans, with former President Barack Obama tweeting, It's a tribute to President Biden's leadership, to the members of the intelligence community who have been working for decades for this moment, and to the counterterrorism professionals that were able to take this trash out without a single civilian casualty. It's possible to root out terrorism without being at war in Afghanistan, and I hope it provides a small measure of peace to the 9-11 families and everyone else who has suffered at the hands of Al-Qaeda. You know, while some people in some countries will have mixed feelings about a drone strike in another country, the general consensus has been this bag of garbage had it coming. He was involved in so many terror attacks that killed thousands. However, with all of that, it is unclear right now how much this will actually affect Al-Qaeda. Right, this, more than anything, I think was about revenge and justice. Right, this worthless human being has been in poor health for years, with it even being rumored at one time that he was already dead. So many of his leadership functions had already been delegated to other group members. And thanks to this new absence, a few people could be taking up the role of the Al-Qaeda's leadership. But for now, that's where we are. There's a lot of moving parts, and we'll have to wait to see. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love Yo faces if you want more news I got you covered right here but I'll see you tomorrow